is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's one minute past eight on LBC. Welcome to Monday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. With me in the studio for the next hour taking your calls are Petri Hoskin, the broadcaster and former LBC presenter, Lara Spirit from West Westminster Reporter for Tortoise Media, Stephanie Boltson, UK correspondent for Velt, and Ali Mirage, a political columnist and social entrepreneur. Uh, you can watch us on Global Player. The number to call 0345 6060 973. 0345 973 Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And welcome to you all. Let's go to our first caller. It's Alex in Watford. Alex, hi. What would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening, hi. panel. Good evening, Petri. Um, <laughs> isn't, isn't it time this country went to war with Russia or face such atrocities in this country by the Russian army. Well, you think there's a serious prospect of Britain being invaded by Russia? Uh, all, all cards. Everything's possible. Uh, with Putin at the helm, uh, I think it's now time to act. You've heard what's happened over the last 24 hours in Ukraine. The, the, man's, the man's mad. He's uh, the second Hitler. Um... Petri Hoskin, I think you are the only one of the five of us to have been a war reporter. Um, you've seen up close what war is like. I've had quite a few callers in the last hour, not quite go as far as Alex has, but effectively saying we should be doing more. People can't really decide what more we should be doing, but the, the, pro the prospect of actually having a war with Russia seems not to be intimidating some people. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it, that, that when we look at what's going on in Ukraine and we keep having this moral outrage and indignation and, and, and horror um, at looking at this war. But we, we're still not doing anything. It's kind of like when you've got a toddler and you say, if you do, if you do that, um, I'm going to punish you. And then they do it and you don't punish them. Um, and now we've got these terrible scenes that we've seen now in uh, Mariupol. And, and I, what I'm so shocked about is that people are shocked by these images. I mean, some of the things that I saw in uh, Bosnia and some of the atrocities, un unimaginable, you would see on a daily basis. And I've been saying for months to anyone that will listen is that war isn't clean, war isn't tidy, there isn't a good guy on one side and a bad guy on the other. There are uh, horrible, disgusting things that happen. As far as us going to war with Russia, I don't know what that would look like because obviously we're a NATO country, it wouldn't just be Britain, um, presumably it would be NATO and, and how would that look? And we've always got the threat of that nuclear button. So at the moment it feels like we're cowering to this bully and it feels like it almost doesn't matter what he does next. We haven't decided when we're going to do something and what it is that we do. So, Alex, I don't know what war looks like for you. What, what do you think war should look like if we got involved in it? What would you want us to do? Petri, I listened to when you was in Bosnia and the reporting, you said, Sir Nicholas Soames, you, you cheered as a great hero. Why haven't we got a Nicholas Soames in this country, leading this country? And we've got to do something, Petri. War is ugly. War is dirty. War is pointless and they the last in the last war they said there don't be another war but this, this can't go on the suffering the ukrainian people the the brutality uh using rape as a as a well it's, it's always people. been used, I'm afraid, uh, during a war, and, and, and no more so in, than in Bosnia. It was my biggest fear was being captured and sent to a rape camp. Um, even just as a journalist. That was something that was with me the entire time that I was there. I'm afraid that women um, tend to suffer much more in a war uh, in that regard. Alex, I just don't know what it could look like. I love how you reverted to type and asked the caller a question. Sorry. It's the first time in four years that a panellist has ever <laughs> asked a caller a question. Well done. <laughs> Ste I'm Stephanie sorry. Bolson. Um... Yeah, I, I, I obviously share the frustration and the 
horror of what, what, what we are hearing and talking about Bosnia or talking about Kosovo. But then um, that was a different situation. And you could also then ask a question, why did we, the West, not intervene in Syria? Because Russia committed the same crimes in Syria and it didn't happen. I remember at the time there were some ideas in this country to do it and then there was some uh, domestic political interest to not do it. Um, but um, it's, somebody said it's, uh, it's, it's not a symmetric... Oh, it's, it was an asymmetric uh, conflict in the past when, for example, when you went against Serbia, but now it's Russia. And NATO, in the end, is a defensive alliance. So, of course, then that's why in Brussels they insist, as long as NATO is not attacked, they will not attack back. But I'm sitting here as a German and I'm having a very hard time uh, talking about this anyway, because um, Germany, rightly, is very much criticized these days about actually being uh, stepping on the brake to not have tougher sanctions to continue buying oil and gas from uh, from uh, Russia but it's 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 very complex because if you stop immediately buying gas from Russia hundreds of thousands of people will lose their jobs um, and maybe the summer will be all right but in the winter people will start freezing so it's um, but I agree I, I can't I can't see these atrocities and read all this and um, I'm afraid I, I don't have an answer. I think you're being a bit un unfair on your own country no, I'm there, not. In, in a sense. Well, because I think, I mean, 70 years of German foreign policy and defence policy have effectively been thrown up in the air. And I mean, for the new Chancellor to do that, I mean, that was quite something. We've had Frank Walter uh, Steinmeier today say, look, we got it wrong. I was all in favour of sort of reaching out to Russia and all, having all of this gas and oil from them. I got it wrong. Everyone got it wrong. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure we're having those kind of soul-searching conversations in this country. Yeah, I mean, you, you if I may say, in Britain you have a, quite a lot of advantages. First of all, you are on an island. You psychologically don't have the experience of being... Yeah. It's there, there are land borders. You still have the channel. It's really, I think, deep, deep um, psychological difference. Also, you are much less dependent on... Um, energy from Russia, although there's a lot of energy coming from outside and from dodgy countries, if you like. But, I mean, still, Ian, if you, if you, we, we should really heavily criticize Germany because a lot of people for a long time said to Merkel and the SPD both, I mean, the CDU and the SPD, what are you doing? You're making yourself so dependent on Russia and they just mm. continue doing it. So, of course, the, yeah, it's good to now turn around, but it's too late. The, the problem is, the, the people who did say that, and there were many people saying that, were then just accused of being anti-Russian, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, or, or hawks or whatever. It's yeah. always easy. Um, Lara? Mm. I mean, I can understand why the reaction of people to the scenes that we saw yesterday and, and over the weekend was, as kind of Macron said, unbearable. I mean, it was appalling. And you can understand why people see those scenes and they immediately think that we, there must be more that we can do. But if you actually look at what it is that we can do, we can ramp up sanctions. And actually, the most recent YouGov poll showed what I thought was a, a really surprisingly high amount of support. 52%, I think it was, uh, said that they would um, take a personal economic hit, basically, in order for tougher sanctions on Russia. And it's clear that there are further sh sanctions. But I, there is not an appetite to go directly to war, as Alex says, uh, with Russia. I think that is not on the cards for, for anybody, really, at this stage, uh, among Western leaders. I have been slightly concerned because I think if you do look at what happened over the weekend, there was um, a sort of third way, which was this idea that the ICC um, would come in and, and kind of be able in the future to prosecute Russia for war crimes. And I think, unfortunately, people might be placing a bit too much faith in the ICC to be able to deliver justice um, ever, you know, and, and even if it did come at a much later date. I mean, we speak about uh, rape and it's very correct that women do bear a huge amount uh, of the suffering that comes from the atrocities that are committed as part of these war crimes. And actually, the ICC has only secured one conviction in its 20 years of, of operation for, for rape as part of a war crime. So I think many people will look at that and be understandably frustrated at the idea that the solution posed by some leaders at the moment is to um, collect evidence and um, for some sort of retrospective justice in the future. I can't imagine being able to personally get Putin to, to the ICC, for example, no. to face that. So I think it's understandable that people have a level... Well, they got Milosevic there, there, didn't they? But, uh, but, but how many years did it take? Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, even just, I think, last year, a 100-year-old um, German man was put in front of the Hague. So, I mean... This, these things can take for 
absolutely forever. And and the idea that we're going to see a 69-year-old, 70-year-old Putin who reportedly is unwell mm. face any war crime uh, tribunal <laughs> is, I, I think, faintly ridiculous. Ali Mirage. Well, Ian, uh, I, I totally agree with what um, uh, Laura and, and Petri just said about the the uh, ICC and bringing uh, Putin and uh, his cronies uh, to justice there. I don't think it will ever happen. I can't see Russia ever uh, agreeing or sending Putin to face uh, criminal charges in that uh, particular environment. I think on the broader context of this and what the West should be doing now, look, uh, you said, Ian, that it's uh, thrown German foreign policy up in the air after 70 years. For the last 30 years, they have had a strategic... A goal to try and do this Wandel durch Handel or change through trade, try to uh, reform the the, uh, the the Russians by engaging with them very closely. Uh, Nord Stream 2 was all about that, to bring uh, Russian gas uh, into Germany. That was part of it. Um, but as Olaf Scholz recently said a few days after the invasion in, in February, this is an Zeitenwender, an epoch-changing event. He's, he's totally. very good at the old German, isn't he, Stefan? Is a lot of German speakers. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not as good as you, Ian, because I know you studied it. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm impressed. I've been practising all afternoon. Uh, no, so, so, so look, yeah, Olaf Scholz has recognised the fact, he said that uh, he's going to spend 100 billion extra on defence. He's going to go to 4% of GDP, which is, you remember Trump a few years ago admonishing the Western yeah. allies for not spending enough on defence. Well, that's been a wake-up call. And he's also said that he's not going to close the remaining nuclear facilities at the moment. He's also going to open two new LNG ports. Um, and this is going to take some time. The reason why certain Western powers can't do more, and we're in a slightly different position here, is because they're still dependent on Russian Energy, that, that's the, the fact. Now, Franz Timmermans, the vice president of the European Commission, has said that the, the EU is going to try and reduce its dependence on Russian gas by two-thirds by the end of the year. That makes a lot of sense. But one thing that worries me, uh, and this is uh, Liz Truss, for example, coming out, and she's following her boss, Boris Johnson's lead today, saying Putin must fail. So all this tough talk, it's like, I'm a bit confused by this. There are only three options as she's I see. She's not going to say he must succeed, is she? No, no, but Ian, look, there are three Pods here. One is Putin gets deposed either by his own people or gets assassinated by a foreign power. Can't see it happening. Might do, you know, fair enough, but can't see it happening. The second is he leaves with his tail between his legs like the Soviets left in Afghanistan in 89 with nothing. Can't see that happening. What I can see happening is that Zelensky is going to have to sit down with Putin, however unsavory that is, and it is deeply unsavory, as Zelensky has said to negotiate around Donbass, around Crimea, and around Ukrainian neutrality. That's where it's going to end up, unfortunately. And the question I've got and have been having for the last few weeks is, if that's where we're going to end up in some way, shape, or form, what are we doing here, having all these people die every day? But it's almost impossible to imagine that Zelensky could sit down with Putin and negotiate away territory that is Ukrainian. But unfortunately, Ian, that's exactly what's going to happen. And despite, I think that is what's going to happen. And despite... Uh, Joe Biden talking tough a few days ago saying, you know, Putin, how can this man stay in power and we, you know, we stand with our Ukrainian friends? Well, the reality is you don't. You stand with them to a certain degree. You're not giving them uh, MiG fighter jets because you don't want to be seen to be giving offensive weapons or tanks, which I completely don't understand, quite frankly, because the West is already involved. I mean, Petri says the West hasn't done anything. It has done something. It's imposed economic warfare yeah. through sanctions. <laughs> yeah, you said it hasn't really done much. Um, I've got it here, I wrote it down. I've, well, you said it hadn't done anything, which I thought was a little bit unfair, Petri, because I think it has done something. <laughs> I think it's imposed economic sanctions. It's uh, Putin would regard that as an act of war. And on the military side, it's done stuff, but it hasn't done enough. So all this tough talk from Biden, all this tough talk... But look, we have to decide where that line is, yeah. don't we? And that was yeah, the but, point I was making, but, is, yeah. is at what point do we say, OK, now you've crossed that line, we really can't ignore this. And, and, and I don't know where that line is. But and if somebody war, does, Petri. then tell me. But Petri, the problem is, you get into a hot war with a nuclear power. This is not Kosovo, it's not Serbia, it's not even Iraq, right? You're so dealing what with a does nuclear he have power. to do for us to get involved, well, in your view? Well, well, I think, to be honest with you, uh, that is a very interesting question. He's, I don't think Putin, like, I can't see into the man, uh, the, the, the mind of the man. I think he's not stupid enough to go and attack a NATO state. I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to arm the Ukrainians as much as we can. We're going to have to try and reduce our dependence on uh, Russian energy, but that's a longer term policy. And that is the problem that we've got here. The UK can come out and say these things because we're less exposed than other European powers. Okay, well, for the first time in the history of cross question, I'm going to go to a break on time. Uh, more of your calls in a moment 0345. 
0330 is quarter past eight. This is LBC. This is... Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 18 minutes past eight on LBC. With me in the studio, Ali Mirage, Stephanie Bolson, Lara Spirit and Petri Hoskin. Let's go to our next call. It's Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, hello Ian. <clears throat> Does the panel think that we have a selective morality between comparing two wars? One we are involved in a certain extent in and the other one we're not. Uh, is Yemen and Ukraine. War crimes have been committed in both. So have we got a selective morality? About do, do you know what Ukraine the difference is, Ben? Years? I think the difference is we have pictures from Ukraine. We don't have pictures from uh, Yemen. So I think it gives us an entirely false impression in a way. Stephanie, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, Yemen is one of the, apart from the war in Syria, of course, is one of these conflicts that we know for a long time that's going on. We know it's absolutely horrendous and hundreds of thousands of people are starving. Uh, children, hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands of children are dying. Um, and yeah, there is not much reporting on that. It's a very complicated conflict as well between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I think uh, there is a ceasefire right now for the first time in years, which maybe helps a little bit the situation in, in Yemen. But yeah, we probably have a selective uh, perception of what we are interested in. Then, of course, Ukraine is much closer. And because it is a war by Russia, it affects us directly. And it, I mean, the war in Yemen, while it's terrible, it doesn't scare us because it's very far away. Ukraine is not far away. I mean, Kiev is the same distance from Berlin that Paris is from Berlin. So it's a very close. I've been many times to Ukraine, so it's a country I, I know quite well. Um, and also many people know have Ukrainian friends. Lots of Ukrainians live here. So, yes, it's selective and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible to say that. But uh, we obviously give much more attention to that than to Yemen. It's wrong, but that's a fact. Ali? Well, I, I, Ben, I don't think it's just the Yemen issue where it's double standards. I actually think if you look at what's happening in, um, in China with the Uyghurs, which the US government has itself said is a genocide, uh, we're, not, we're, not doing, we're not doing much. We're certainly not doing what we're doing in Ukraine. Now, the question is why? Now, Ian makes a good point about pictures. I think that pictures tell a thousand words. We know that. They're very powerful. And I also think uh, Stephanie's point about proximity is also a very important and powerful one. But I would like to add a third one, which is our complete and utter interconnectedness and dependence on 
China for our supply chains, Russia for a, a part of our energy. We have gone down a road where, and this started under, I mean, it wasn't only uh, them, but Cameron and Osborne, this great opening to China. It's only in recent years that the Conservative Party backbenchers through the, um, the China Research Group have been a lot more sceptical about this and raised issues around China's involvement in 5G, around the nuclear issue, etc., that we're trying to pull back a little bit. But the reality is China takes a 100-year view when it comes to geopolitics. We, we, barely, we barely take a three- or four-year view. Uh, and that's the way our electoral cycle works. The same with, same with Russia to a certain extent. So I think we in the West have taken our off the ball in terms of our interdependence and over-reliance on countries that, frankly, have a completely different worldview. They're, they're old 19th-century great powers that have a ruthless view of their interests. And this whole nonsense that we keep peddling that... We're going to try by trading with people, we're going to t- turn them into democracies. Look at what the Chinese have done in Hong Kong. Complete and utter failure on our part to believe that they would change. Why would they change? The problem we've got is, I heard Gillian Tett, the FT journalist, recently um, give a talk. She's written a book called Anthrovision. Makes a point about the fact that we in the West spend all of our time trying to look at the world through our own lens, believing everyone sees the world as we do, rather than actually putting ourselves in the shoes of our opponents and actually looking at the world as they see it, right? And at the moment, you're in a battle uh, right now for supremacy. Western liberalism is under attack. Even Francis Fukuyama, who wrote that book, you may remember in 1992, The End of History and the Last Man. Well, history hasn't ended, uh, and even Francis can recognize that. We're in a very difficult position. The only way here is, I think, a little bit more in, in independence, self-sufficiency. Globalization is not dead, but we need to be mindful and careful. Patrick. Um, Evening, Ben. Yeah, I think that actually we have selective morality when it comes to most things. Um, And I don't think we're alone in that. I think that we're... Why would you look at me when you say selective morality? (laughs) I know about your morality and I I also know how selective it is. So let's not discuss that here. Um, But yeah, I I think that um, I think that we've always had this problem. I think everybody around the world does that you choose who to get into bed Mm. with. You know, Mm. when we couldn't buy Russian oil, we went and and, and, and ran off to the Middle East and and trying to get into bed with with people who are really unsavoury. I just think that this this morality i don't know if there's any place for it in politics anymore i don't know if there's any Has place for it been? no yeah. but seemingly now you know when we've when we've got our, our our political classes going it's okay we won't take russian oil but we will take it from saudi arabia or we'll take it and and i'm sort of going well how is that really much better to governors you know? to choose as they well say. exactly um, and as you were rightly saying about china mm-hmm. i mean china's uh, human rights issues are absolutely breathtakingly appalling and have been for a very, very long time. But we deal and we'll take the money and we'll, you know, we'll even hand them um, aid money, which as we know is a, is a brown envelope stuffed with cash, you know, as, as, as a soft bribe. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that we have selective morality when it well, comes to most things, You either to call be fair. it selective morality, Lara, or you call it real politics, yes, don't you? Exactly. Another well, exactly. German word. Mm. Another, in. another one. <laughs> and I think this point about Fukuyama is very true because back then, you know, you had communism, capitalism, East and West. And I think one of the reasons for this selective morality, and it's true that it does exist, is partly because Ukraine is acting as a kind of proxy for this big question of democracy versus authoritarianism. And that is something that many of us here feel like we have a personal and obvious stake in. And that's one of the reasons why the fear that we mentioned, I think, is true true but I do think even so and even though you might call it real politique it's really important to ask this question about selective morality mm. because you look at the foreign aid budget for example and you look at the humanitarian crisis in Yemen and the aid that we're going to have to be sending to Ukraine much of that is aid that won't now be going to places like Yemen that needs it and unfortunately the lack of focus really does lead to lives being lost and a huge amount of suffering so even though it's something that of course many people are are guilty of and even though it's kind of plainly obvious that we may feel all of these human instincts which translate into quote unquote unfair political decision making it's very important that we scrutinise it I think and are aware of where it comes from Right uh, Ben thank you for that let's see if we can squeeze one more question in before the 8.30 news so you each have one minute to answer this very simple question from Margaret in Durham. Hello, Margaret. Hi, and good evening, Paul. Hi. Not so simple. What I want to say, I'll preface this by saying many years ago, I stood under the flags in the United Nations building in Geneva, and it, it was emotional for me. I said a quiet, deo gratias thinking that there'd never be another Hitler because where evil appears on it, 
troops from all these nations would combine and get rid of it. I am so disappointed in the United Nations and this crazy scheme now where one country can veto a decision. I've lost faith in the United Nations. But the panel tell me, what is it about if it can't act at a time like this? Ali Mirage. Well, I think the UN uh, can't act uh, often. I mean, you remember the, the invasion of Iraq uh, and, and the fact that there was no second resolution on that. So we're very selective when we apply these things. I think you're absolutely right to bring up the United Nations. And I shared a tear myself when I was in Geneva and indeed in New York as, 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 a, as a sixth former uh, at the UN because I thought at, the, that, at those, that stage of my life, I was very starry-eyed. I thought, you know, I wanted to read international relations and go and you know, help with the world order. But, you know, we have to deal with reality. And you mentioned real politique, uh, Ian, and that's fundamental where we are. Countries have interests. There's an issue, there are concepts like the balance of power, and states act to protect their interests and to acquire power, and that's what they do, unfortunately, and, and things get these things get caught up in the mix and they're collateral damage. Is it time, Patrick Hoskin, to reform the Security Council? Absolutely. I don't know what the mechanism yeah. to do that I, I is. don't know what it is either, but the idea that, the, that an aggressor can have veto... I think you should immediately lose veto if you are the aggressor. There you go. That was less than a minute. Well, that, that's a very good point, actually. Yeah. I hadn't heard that made before. Oh. Not always nice to hear an original thought on this programme. Oh, good well done. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Lara, <laughs> challenge. Can we have an original thought, please? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not sure you can. I think, I think completely, valid, um, completely valid concerns raised about the credibility of the UN every single time um, it bows down to an aggressor and refuses to, to stand up. I think it loses credibility. And when you have mechanisms by which single aggressors or single outliers who do not conform with democratic norms or standards are able to exercise control over a giant multilateral organisation that's plainly not in the interests of diplomacy and it's plainly not going to achieve any level of global peace, I don't think. Stephanie? I think you have to think whether you uh, you ditch the system of veto powers mm. because the veto powers are those who are well, actually Presumably seeing... the countries that have the veto could veto the veto. veto. The veto <laughs> <powers>. <laughs> yeah, it's like France that doesn't allow Strasbourg to be closed down as the seat yeah. of the European no, indeed. economy. Right. So, yeah. Great restaurant. Well, there, yeah, a lot of text, a lot of yeah. nice Mostly money German. made in Strasbourg. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's good to spend your money on nice dinners in Strasbourg, <laughs> I think. Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, you have to radically change it. But of course, if those who have uh, the veto it, stop it, 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 it is bizarre. I can't think of a single thing that the, uh, the Secretary General of the UN has said about Ukraine. Can can any of no, you? it's crackers. I'm, I agree with you. They 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 appear to have disappeared in a puff of blue smoke somewhere. I don't know. Mm. Have you heard anything? No, not, no, they not, not, no, no, no. Really. He, I, he, you mean uh, Guterres? Yes. I, he said one thing that I thought was interesting. I, I, I read that. Do tell us. Yes, one. <laughs> which was the consequences of the war in of Russia's war on Ukraine on um, the whole world in terms of people starving because there won't be any wheat coming out of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So that's something he said that we must look much beyond Russia and Ukraine. I he take it I take like it back that. almost. <laughs> um O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. If you'd like to uh, th put in a call to the program, remember you can watch us on Global Player. And don't forget, if you miss any of the program, you can catch up on the Cross Question podcast or on Global Player. We'll take more of your calls in just a moment. Let's get the news headlines on LBC at eight thirty with Helen Hodinot. The government has announced it's going ahead with plans to privatise Channel 4. A spokesperson for the broadcaster says it's disappointed with the decision. The Foreign Secretary says Russia must now be hit with the maximum level of sanctions over atrocities in Ukraine. Liz Truss is urging European allies to go further following mass killings around the capital of Kyiv, which the Kremlin has denied. And the government's former ethics chief says she made an error of judgement after being fined for parties during lockdown. Down. Helen McNamara has apologised after receiving a fixed penalty notice following a number of gatherings in Downing Street and Whitehall. LBC weather, mainly dry and cloudy in the south and east tonight. Rain and drizzle in the north and west. Frosty in the far northeast with wintry showers. A low of freezing. This is LBC. <laughs>
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.32. You're listening to or watching LBC's Cross Question. With me in the studio, Ali Mirage, political columnist and social entrepreneur and a DJ as well. I've, I did know about this before. Well, well, actually, what kind of music? Well, I play house and in fact oh, you actually gave me uh, you actually gave me a compendium of, of Margaret Thatcher's speeches once, which I yeah. did a, a, a remix of um, The Ladies Not For Turning against some house beats. Can you send it to me? I want to listen to this. <laughs> I, I, I did it live, do. actually. I did it live. <laughs> What do you wear when you do? Uh, I, I norm, well, to be honest, I normally a wear no. I wear a t-shirt and I wear a, I wear a baseball cap. But to not, I mean, look, it didn't end well for William Hague, right? So, but, no, but I when, when I'm there, it, you go into a different persona. And I, I have my residency in Shoreditch, and I play around the world. So, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Stephanie Boltson from Develt, are you an aspirant DJ? No, 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 no. But I, I, I like dancing, so you, I want to know where you're playing. <laughs> and then I, I actually played at a club in Berlin called Tausend. A number of times. Uh, we yeah. know about Berlin clubs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some, some, some of us do. Um, Laura Spirit is Westminster reporter at Tortoise. Is that sort of conventional political reporting job? I mean, Tortoise is obviously an yes. online platform. Tortoise is an online platform and it's slower news, so it's it's typically longer. So you have to write form. a little bit more slowly. <laughs> no, you just take you just see things hopefully a bit more thoroughly and clearly. It's Great podcast yes, I like as well. It. I had a look. I had a look through it. I Did you? It was very good. Yeah, I thought it was very good. I like the idea of waiting a bit, not rushing. Yeah. Because because all these news organisations now yeah. rush to the news. Talking of waiting Never a bit, long this is Petri Hoskin. <laughs> right, let's go so to our next caller, <laughs> Kath in Bingley. Hello, Kath. Hello, Ian and panel. Um, given um, today's report, again, about the disasters awaiting us with climate change, and then looking at all the utter chaos at ports and airports, makes me think that uh, most people aren't really taking anything on board about climate change so just carrying on as normal um what do you think might actually make them sit up and take notice good question um who wants to go first on this no one well, I could uh, Ali, that. go on. Well, or, uh, on. On the climate change thing, Kath, I think, I think you've raised a very interesting point and a very important point, which is we can all pontificate and we can all... Uh, Get, get extremely concerned about the magnitude of the problem. And it is a huge problem, right? I think most people would probably agree on that. There are a few deniers out there, but, um, you know, most, most people do recognise the issue. The, the fact is that we all have our role to play. So everyone expects... We've got used to government solving all our problems all the time. And government does have a big role to play. And then later this week, we're going to hear about the, the energy strategy and about energy security and how it's going to be balanced with um, meeting this net zero commitment that we've got to decarbonize the electricity supply by 2035 we've got to get to net zero across everywhere by 2050 so there are many things we need to do to get to that point um and i think i think on one side we've got to be uh, the government's got to be recognize the fact that if you talk about renewable power and everyone thinks renewable power is like a panacea to everything i can tell you that there's been a massive exponential growth in renewables uh, in recent years. Uh, the costs have come down in terms of providing uh, t uh, tariffs and subsidies and uh, things, etc., to this. But it's still intermittent power. You still need baseload power. So security and, and all that stuff is part of it. But I also think on the demand side, we also need to have a frank conversation. And this is where, Kath, your point comes in. If we're all going to continue to go on as many holidays as we went on before, we're, we're not going to walk more. We're not going to cycle more. We've got to do our bit. We've got to do our bit. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to do our bit, though, what, isn't what, it? What, what, wait till you're Sorry. asked, Petra. <laughs> you, I'm responding. You, you know thought, the, you know I thought the we rules. were supposed to respond. Yeah, in, um, in, a, in a moment, when, you're, okay. when you're invited right. to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Bolts. I mean, the um, point here, this is Groundhog Day, isn't it? There's nothing new in this report. We know it all already. Uh, we had all these discussions mm. at COP26. What's the point of it? Yeah, exactly. Hi, and hi, Kath. Um, I, I actually, I was thinking today, I, I covered uh, COP26, and just because we talked about the UN, mm. I've rarely seen such raw politics on the Saturday when Alok Sharma ended up crying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was incredible. And when it was about, is it now phasing down or mm. phasing out? And it's just one little word, yeah. word. And you saw two countries blocking it, and that's it. Because they had to change the wording, and that means... Mm -hmm means a lot. But um, talking about what you can do yourself, thanks to the mayor of London, we skipped our car because of the ultra low emission zone, because we had an old diesel. And yeah, we don't have a car since the 25th of October and it works. 
Don't develop pay enough that you can afford a new no. car, Stephanie. No. Honestly. No. You need to get a job at Tortoise Media. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Lara. Um, what would make people stand on potatoes? I mean, not a war in Ukraine that puts energy security front and centre, I think. I mean, that report itself was was damning. Our emissions at the highest they've ever been, re, you know, rising 6% last year when, you remember, we had pandemic restrictions, which meant that you wouldn't have expected it necessarily to have risen by that much. So really a huge amount. I think talking about the raw politics there, the the real kind of party politics of the energy strategy that's coming this week is making this whole debate even more complicated, I think, because you have what is actually quite a large amount of public support for things like onshore wind, especially large if you're given... Is that? Is there that is, especially really? large if you're given... Yeah, especially large if you're given concessions on your energy bills, for example, if you can see them. So that's why I think Grant Schaff's comments, you will have seen them that they're an eyesore and he didn't like they the noise. Mm. We're, we're frustrating to some people in Canada but you know they are they are as Ed Miliband has said one of the cheapest forms of energy that you can have getting progressively cheaper so you will see in this energy strategy I think a, a bit of conflict between what you might think of as a practical solutions for getting to net zero by the government target of 2050 and what is proving to be quite a difficult political sell in the cabinet to find some level of consensus especially when you have voices like Jacob Rees-Mogg um, you know being very supportive of things like fracking, for example, obviously expensive hydrocarbons, which in my personal view aren't going to be the road to net zero nor provide a greater degree um, of energy security. So that, I think, the del much delayed energy strategy on account of these political differences is, is making people who will read this report and feel very frustrated, perhaps even more angry at the fact that there isn't more being done. Petri, the floor is yours. I don't want to talk now. <laughs> uh, no. I d what I was going to say is I think that it's very difficult. Human beings don't do well under the instruction, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Um, and I think that the the leadership... So Boris um, has got to have a wind turbine at Chuck, <laughs> yeah. has he? Well, I think that you've, they've got to stop taking these private jets when they go to any of any of the meetings about the environment. We've got to see Liz Truss get on a, 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 a normal aircraft when they can, not take private planes to Australia, etc. Or indeed et the leader of Brighton Council when he went to COP. Uh, pre precisely. So uh, what I'm saying to you is that it's all very well to ask us to, to recycle and to do our bit, to give up our cars. But when you see see um, Sadiq Khan going around London in a, in a, you know, in a Range Rover with two behind him to walk his dog. It's very difficult, I think, for somebody to preach at me and yet appear to be doing something different. So, and I don't think any of us do very well under the guise of, don't do that, but I'm going to carry on doing it. Shall I defend Sadiq Khan? You can. Because I think, given who he is and given the threats that are often made on his life, I think he does deserve security. OK, I mean, that, that's that's fine. But I'm, t I'm talking from the point of view of what other people think when they see that. And you see other people um, uh, behaving in that way and telling mm. us all to get on public transport. And yet you've got politicians who are, who are charging their cabs. But it, it, to in, in the end, though, does it matter really what we do as individuals does it make mm -hmm. any difference isn't it more about what individual governments do and until we get the chinese and the indians on board yeah. frankly it doesn't really matter what you or i do i, I think it's both and i think you're absolutely right the the, the big movement's going to come from china and india now the reality is they're saying to the west well hang on a second you industrialized uh, when you wanted to and used coal exactly. for a lot of the, the thing we're going to have our time in the sun now um we're going to try and do what we can but you know we want to we want to develop and, and tough so we're going to have to take on more of that burden ourselves in the west and i do think it is partly on governments and you know for the first time i think later this week we're going to hear a serious uh, conversation about nuclear power now i'm not saying nuclear power is a panacea i mean it's got a lot of issues particularly on waste around public support, all sorts of things. But we do need a diversified energy mix, both for a security angle and also for a decarbonisation angle. But at least we're having a conversation about this, seriously. But on the personal responsibility point, I do think we all have to do our bit. Look, co the pandemic was a great thing. I started cycling. I've never, I haven't really cycled in my life uh, because I, 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 you know, I value my life. But I did, <laughs> I did. And I, you know, I was cycling up and down the mile so end so road. Have you ever a seen a DJ on a bike? <laughs> Yeah, but you know, on the blue thing, I do think that some of the some of those cycle lanes by King's Cross, for example, is bizarre, right? I mean, there's no one cycling in them, and it's bugging up the traffic. But we need to do our bit, and I think it's easy for us in London, many of us, to say, like, give up your car, and it's easier to do here. Not the same for everyone around the country. So where we can make sacrifices and do uh, do more, we should. 
Right. Um, Kath, thank you very much for that. Let's move on to a text question from Emily in Leeds. Jacob Rees-Mogg said today on LBC that Boris Johnson was just given bad information about the parties at Downing Street. He didn't mean to mislead anyone, apparently. Does the panel believe one word of that? Stephanie. No. <laughs> no. Laura. No. <laughs> this is going to be a very short question round, isn't it? Petri. Uh-uh. Nope. Can, can, I, can I just say? Can I just say uh, on you know I, I used to quite like Jacob Rees-Mogg when he was not in the cabinet. Uh, I think he's probably realised that no one else is going to give him a job, um, so he has to sort of defend his boss to the hilt. And I quote: He was saying that it, the the lockdown rules were actually inhuman. Well, I was scratching my head, wondering. Well, it was it was his government that actually introduced <laughs> the lockdown rules. And by the way, Ian, I, I I made a point of actually noting down some of the Nolan principles of public life right back in 1995. Really? Yes, I did. Selflessness, integrity, Someone objectivity. who does some prep on this programme, Patrick. Se selflessness, <laughs> integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. Now, please tell me which of those seven principles have we witnessed in the last few months over this Partygate fiasco? And the thing that really upsets me is not the Prime Minister, because he is the hide of a rhinoceros, right? We know that. What really upsets me is decent, hard-working, competent ministers like Nadim Zahawi, who is one of the best in the government, having to go out and defend this nonsense day in, day out. They're dipping their hands in the nonsense, this kind of nonsense, and they all get tarred by this. So I think it's a really sad moment for our democracy, frankly, that we're here and I think people have a right to be very angry and we'll see how angry they are on May the 5th. Laura, when you talk to uh, cabinet ministers, ministers, do, do they come out with this stuff that Jacob rees does privately to you or do, do they give a, shall we say, more independent viewpoint? Oh, I don't think privately that anybody is in it under much doubt that rules were broken. But you'll understand when you see the lines like this why they have to come out with this kind of stuff. Because, of course, if he if if he says that the rules were broken, he would, of course, be in contravention of the ministerial code, which is something that mm. Kisama has been quoting again and again and we've seen. And so you have this kind of very odd experience where these these ministers, as you said, some of them abundantly competent, who are having to go out and defend these lines. But I think of you know, of the twelve parties that the Met have said they've been investigating, six of them, Boris Johnson himself is suspected as having attended. I mean is he saying that he was given the wrong information about the parties that allegedly happened in his flat? Is he saying that he was given the wrong information about his own birthday party <laughs> that allegedly took place? So I think we'll see when the Met... We, we've been told that although we're seeing this drip drab of, of fines and we don't necessarily know who's going to be given them and the Met have said they're not releasing names, they are going to tell us if Boris Johnson himself is fined. And I think, yes, May 5th is a real reckoning, but that moment at which the PM is either issued a fine um, or not will be a real reckoning and whether or not he's he's going to admit whether the rules are breaking. You have to remember that the Downing Street line currently still is that the Prime Minister isn't willing to confirm that the rules were even broken among those who were issued fines already in those initial two tranches. So I think as soon as that moment happens, we're going to see a kind of real moment of reckoning, um, probably not among Jacob Rees-Mogg's in the Cabinet, but certainly among some of the others. And Stefan, you're obviously based in London, but you follow what goes on in Germany. Have there been anything similar to this, where German politicians have been had up for transgressing the the lockdown rules? No, not, not as far as I'm aware. No, if anything, they just uh, exaggerated the lockdown rules. And there was a lot of fighting um, between the lender and the federal level. Angela Merkel was, was much stricter. And then certain lender who had lower cases didn't want such strict mm. rules. But it, it was a very different situation. But they all did a bad job. Wherever you look in Europe, they all did a bad job. So, But I, I, I just wonder what the strategy is now. Because why, why don't they just come out and say... We made a mistake, but look at what we are facing. Um, we, we need to we need to move on and govern this country. I don't understand why they continue hi this hiding game. Right, we'll take more of your calls in a moment. 0345 6060 973. Emily, thank you for that text question. If you want to text your question, you can do so 84850. It's 846. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Call the Cabinet exclusively here on LBC. We welcome Brexit Opportunities Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg. Brenda's in St Ives. We were told if we exited the EU, we would have lower energy prices, cut in VAT and cheaper food. You lied to us. We have tariffs on food cheaper coming food, from... clothing and yeah, footwear. Yeah, that's right. Because we have tariffs on food, clothing and footwear. Food price inflation up 4.3% yeah. last month. These are two different things. With the trade deals that we are doing, and particularly important with Australia and New Zealand, we are taking tariffs off. You are so patronising, Mr Rees-Mogg, and I find it absolutely outrageous. Big Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. It's 8.50 on LBC. Ali Marana, Stephanie Boltson, Lara Spirit and Petri Hoskin with me taking your calls and texts. And here's a text from Frederica in Brighton. More than 100 organisations have pulled out of the UK's first ever global LGBT plus conference over the government stands on conversion therapy. Is this government an ally of LGBT plus people as it claims? Lara. Well, I mean, this was a... a very dramatic U-turn from the government, right? A U-turn um, on a U-turn. A U-turn yeah. on a U-turn, exactly, yeah. and a very so short, a talent, a very short lived it? one indeed. And I, I think this episode especially highlights just, we talk about Partygate potentially being over, we talk about the war in Ukraine, meaning that Boris Johnson is now safe. I think this episode highlights how Boris Johnson is still in thrall and highly responsive, above all else, to a selector of Conservative backbench MPs, right? And this is where a huge amount of the controversy happened, because those were people who were initially uh, wanted a ba- wanted the ban on conversion uh, therapy lifted, uh, and then, you know, the fallout happened, and it and it was reversed once again. And I, I do not think... Well, I think it was were Conservative not- backbenchers... I mean, plus the reaction from LGBT groups that forced that U-turn. Well, other, so there were, there were others... I mean, I think Tory backbenchers are actually probably split down the middle on this. I think you're right, but remember that you only need 54 Conservative yeah. MPs, right, to force a no-confidence vote, and we don't know how many letters are in. So you're talking about very small numbers of disgruntled MPs that you need to square off in order to shore up your personal support. So you are just not in a position at the moment waiting for the Met to conclude their investigation to be able to take a, a strong stance on something that some of your backbenchers very vehemently disagree with. Petri? I think when it suits them. I think that uh, the, the question is, are they an ally of uh, LGBTQ plus? I, I, look, I think that clearly the, the, the idea of conversion therapy, I just find utterly bonkers. I mean, it's probably 99% of my friends are gay. Um, <laughs> and and the, the idea that you could convert... You wouldn't want to and, exaggerate at all. I'm really not. Are you not? No. <laughs> Actually, genuinely not. Um, I, you know, the, the the idea of any form of conversion therapy. So even the fact that it existed when it when it was going to be yeah. banned, I was like, what? You know, what, what do you mean we're going to ban this? And then it wasn't banned. Look, um, yeah, I think that the, the government is is supportive of LGBTQ people when it suits them. Stephanie. It's my answer. I, I admit I'm still trying to form an opinion, and I'm very happy to to get better understanding of all this but i understood the reason why they said they wouldn't uh, ban conversion therapy in the in which case in the trans trans trans, it's because you might have a legal problem with advising children or young people and that's an argument i do understand if that's the case then i think it's a very delicate question which you have to carefully approach but maybe i'm wrong and i no, you're, you're absolutely right um but people in these campaigning organisations don't see it that way. I think they they often see it in quite a blunt way and say, well, you have to ban it for everyone. Now, I mean, I think it should be banned for everyone. Mm. But if there is an issue with children who are sort of suffering from gender dysphoria, um, obviously they need to have some sort of advice. Whether you call it advice, whether you call it therapy, I don't know what you call it. But to to say that no professional medical practitioner could talk to a child about that, I think that is one step too far. So whether there's a solution here saying, well, it, it... it has to be done by a, a, prof- a medical professional rather than the sort of quacks yeah. from the religious communities mm-hmm. that do it uh, for gay people. Yeah, I, I don't if, know. if you get rid of conversion therapy, it doesn't stop you from supporting and helping children who have, uh, you know, gender dysphoria. Well, it shouldn't, it but shouldn't. from a legal point of view, I think they're worried that it cre- might. Look, with this government, how many laws has it created recently on a daily basis? Let it create another law that protects children well, I agree who, who are um, gender, you know, gender um, confused and, and, and have... And Ali, when you when you look at it from the point of view of um, of the people that I mean, people who might want uh, are not happy about being gay. Mm-hmm. Remember, I had a caller a few years ago who was in tears on the phone. He was a fifty year old guy. Said he was gay. He didn't want to be gay. And if there was any way that he could not be gay, he was happy to look into it. And I did, even though I'm totally against conversion therapy, it, it did give me a little bit of pause for thought. 
uh, Ian, I think you've summed up some of the issues um, extremely well, and it is a, it is a, an area that uh, you, one has to be handled delicately. Now, I don't think any false sort of conversion therapy um, should be allowed at all. I think that that's wrong, uh, particularly in, in settings, as you say, quack settings. That's, that's not right. Uh, when it comes to the government and understanding their position on things, I mean, it's quite difficult to keep track generally with where the government is on, on, on a lot of issues. I think a Marcus Rashford and the number of U-turns they did on free school meals. So it's kind of like they U-turn so much, you wonder at times if they're on a roundabout. Um, but the point is, um, I don't think forced uh, ther uh, conversion therapy is correct, uh, but I do think there has to be a space for professionals to have conversations around gender dysphoria and other difficult issues where people are, in certain cases, confused or struggling or trying to work out exactly where they see uh, issues. And I think there should be a space for those discussions, but not in a forced setting okay. anyway. Um, right, final question. I've got to ask you for brief answers on this from Seb in Westminster. Hello, Seb. Hi, how's it going? Fine, um, yeah, thank so you. What would you like to ask? Uh, I saw the news about um, Tory MP David Warburton's cocaine and sex assault allegations. Um, and my question is this, is this endemic? Is this a kind of deep systemic issue? Or is this a, a rare standout case? So are, are you really asking our politicians more prone to this sort of thing than any other section of society? Um, I suppose is this an extension of party gay and reflective of, um, you know, the conservative government? Or is this just one person kind of a bad egg? Um, okay. And Westminster reporter Laura Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I absolutely think that there are very serious questions about what protections we have in place as Parliament as a workplace in order to address behaviour like this. Because this particular case, so David Warburton's case, the person that was responsible for HR in Gabriel Hogan's story in, in this case was this MP's wife. So those women who raised these issues would have had to raise it with the wife. Now, that is a difficult question because in Parliament... MPs basically run their offices like a sort of mini company, right? Like you pick who works for you um, and there are not safeguards like there would be in kind of much, much bigger companies, for example, or even normal businesses. So I think this raises a point that has been raised many, many times before, which is that how are we to ensure that there are proper HR procedures in a working place like Parliament? Because this story makes it obvious, I think, that there definitely weren't in this case. Stephanie? Um, I mean, apart from the HR question and, and safeguarding questions, um, Obviously, this is a person who has a, has a public mandate. He's working for the public and therefore um, it, it needs to be exposed and it is, uh, it is right that he, he, he will be sanctioned for what he's done. But I, I mean, I think the, uh, Seb's question was a bit, is, is it a high tension environment? Of course it is. I mean, it is like in many other jobs. Um, there, there is a lot of pressure, but that doesn't mean that you can behave this way. And uh, and take drugs and but do all do you, kind of do you things. think that it's any different to any other um, walk of uh, working life? It's just that we learn, we often learn about them in politics. You, you don't get somebody, I don't know, in the widget industry appearing on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, do you? Yeah, but you you are you are a public servant. That's the difference. Petri. Um, I just want to be conscious of the fact that he's gone into a mental health uh, facility. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't answer to the behaviours that go on in in Parliament. But I think you're right, Ian, in that there are uh, public servants, as in doctors, who suffer greatly uh, taking drugs. Um, and I think that perhaps drug use, particularly cocaine, is more prolific than we think, particularly in the middle classes. And that's certainly an issue that's got to be dealt with. But to answer for whether it's more prolific in in Parliament terms, I, I just couldn't I just couldn't say. I suspect not. Ali? Well, look, I don't think lawmakers should be breaking the law by taking drugs. I think on the uh, sexual impropriety uh, allegations, uh, there should be due process and there should be also a recourse for those um, victims, uh, alleged victims, to go uh, independently, which they have done, and there is that process in Parliament, as it rightly should be. Uh, and we have to wait and see what the outcome of the investigation um, yields. I think, generally speaking, it's not the only isolated case. It's not an isolated case. There have been other cases in Parliament as well. Parliament is a weird place. You're in a place which is super competitive. Everyone's got very sharp elbows. You're, you're working long hours. You're away from your family. Uh, the, the, the opposition's trying to trip you up. Your own party are trying to stab you in the back. People like you, Ian, are trying to trip them up. It, it's, it's not an easy environment. To <laughs> <laughs> it's my no, it's not. No, no, no. But, but, but it's, so it's not, it's not a normal kind of environment. Now, that doesn't excuse any sort of impropriety at all. But anyone who thinks politics is a normal kind of job 
It really isn't a normal kind of job. And I do think there is a, a drinking culture that still pervades Parliament, deeply unhealthy. And, uh, you know, a lot of these politicians don't ever see their families, which is also not great either. So it, it, it's really not ideal. Let's finish on a lighter note. Our fun text question at the end from Mary in Teddington. June Brown was an absolute icon. That's yeah. Doc Cotton to you and me. Yeah. And I'm so sorry she's gone. I would have loved to meet her. Who occupies icon status in your view panel? Stephanie. Icon status. Oh, um... Can we? I have a thing. Lara. <laughs> my dog, is that fine? <laughs> uh, that's actually fine by me. You're, you've gone even further up in my estimation. Petri? If you ever questioned my authority with my gay friends, it's got to be Judy Garland. The icons. Oh, I've got something to tell you about Judy Gold at the moment. Ali? Uh, for me, it's uh, it's got to be Frankie Knuckles, who is known as the godfather of house music, who really invented house music at the warehouse in uh, the, 80, the 80s in Chicago <laughs> and was the first one to really put four to the floor beats behind uh, tracks like Ring My Bell. So, for me, it's him. He's he's my inspiration for becoming a DJ. Wasn't that Anita Ward ring my bell? That was, and he re yeah. and no, he, he did redid it. it didn't yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. And I've got one. I saw him being trashed, and I can be trashed today by a British attorney, Boris Becker, in Southwark Crown Court. You can't believe what went on there today. So he was an icon, and he's completely trashed. We'll read it in the newspapers oh. tomorrow. I have only one icon in my life, and she's sitting. Oh. Right oh. <laughs> so, so smooth. That Petri was Hoskin. the perfect answer. I had to say that in case people, people who weren't watching. <laughs> right. Thank you very much indeed to Ali Mirage, Petri Hoskin, uh, Lara Spirit, and Stephanie Boltz. And we'll have another cross question for you tomorrow at eight. Coming up in the next hour, I want to talk about if we're going to get to net zero, we're all going to have to drive electric cars. How's that going with you? One minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says Russia must now...